Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Our topic today is using ultrasonic nebulization and membrane desalvation for improved trace element measurements in organic solvents with ICP OES and ICP MS. Fred Smith is our presenter today. Fred is a technical product manager for Teledyne CTAC. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing within a week. You will receive an email notification of its availability. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them throughout the presentation using the question feature on your toolbar. Fred will respond to each question via email after the webinar. Now I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Fred Smith. Thank you very much for the introduction, Shelley, and thank you everyone for attending today. And again, uh, to recap, we're going to talk about using an ultrasonic nebulizer uh, as in a previous webinar, but this time we're going to add a membrane desalvation uh, apparatus to the system and this is going to be done to improve element detection limits in organic solvents and we're going to use both ICP OES and ICP MS for detection. So again uh, just to resummarize the ultrasonic nebulizer is largely an accessory for ICP OES and also for ICP MS and sample transport efficiency versus a standard gas-based pneumatic nebulizer to the plasma. This can be very helpful for detection of more difficult elements, especially elements such as arsenic, lead, antimony, serum, selenium, and thallium if you're using ICP OES detection. So we're going to describe the use of the ultrasonic nebulizer, but we're going to add again a membrane desolvator, and that is for detection of trace elements now in volatile organic solvents versus solely in aqueous samples, such as a sample like drinking water or wastewater. So again, how does the ultrasonic nebulizer work? Well, in place of a regulated gas flow for generation of a liquid sample aerosol, such as a pneumatic nebulizer, like a glass concentric nebulizer or a cross floor V group nebulizer, in this case, the liquid sample is pumped across a quartz plate with an underlying oscillating crystal, and that crystal is termed a piezoelectric, where a electrical signal applied to the crystal then uh, imparts a mechanical uh, signal and that can break up the aerosol. Those oscillations then uh, cause the formation of a more efficient aerosol. It's up to about 10 times more efficient than a conventional pneumatic nebulizer for conversion of a liquid sample then into a usable aerosol that can be sent toward the ICP. So a front view of the base uh, ultrasonic nebulizer, and I'll explain the uh, the two number designations. This is the U5000 AT+, plus, which has been widely used for many years uh, for, uh, aqueous and, uh, for aqueous samples, particularly, again, for things like drinking water and wastewater. And you can see on the right-hand side the dimensions, the width, depth, and the height. It's very much a benchtop-style unit. It can be placed on the bench next to the ICP or in a laboratory cart. One detail I'll point out, which is important in our method development, are the two temperature controllers in the uh, lower right side of the electronics module of the system. The top one uh, is for the heater and the bottom one is for the, for the cooler, which cools the condenser. So. A little uh, additional detail of the piezoelectric, which is used to generate the aerosol, is a disc-shaped crystal. And in the green call-out arrow, uh, I'm pointing to a small tan-colored disc, which is the piezoelectric. And on top of it, it is mounted a quartz faceplate. And across the quartz plate is where we'll pump our sample. That transducer, which contains the piezoelectric crystal, as you see in the schematic, is then mounted in front of a spray chamber. You see in the uh, one of the first callouts where argon gas AR is coming in. In this case, the argon gas is going to be a, a, uh, acting simply as a carrier gas. It's not going to be used to generate the sample aerosol. 
we're going to rely on the piezoelectric to do that. Once the aerosol is generated, it'll then be carried or swept by the argon gas through a heated, uh, what we call either a U-tube or a J-tube, to keep it in a uh, vapor form, and then through a condenser, and that will then strip out any excess sample solvent before the dried sample particles then reach the ICP. So after the piezoelectric, we have a desolvation system so as not to overload the ICP which with too much solvent, be it water or be it an organic solvent. So when we then approach organic solvents, particularly volatile ones, where the boiling points can be, say, under 120 degrees C, there are a number of potential problems, and these include ICP instability or failure, carbon buildup on the sample introduction components, such as the ICP torch and the ICP MS sampler and skimmer cones. In addition, we can then have complex carbon-based emission background, which can hinder lower detection limits. And in ICP MS, we can have solvent-based mass spectral interferences. And one example we'll see is the carbon dimer. So carbon 12, carbon 12 uh, adds up to 24, uh, giving a uh, interference on magnesium 24. And this is a particular one you're using quadrupole-based ICPMS systems with mostly unit mass resolution. So there are a number of things then um, that can hinder analysis when attempting to introduce organic solvents. So in this case, with the ultrasonic nebulizer, we're going to add another component to it. So then you see the number designation that we use changes from U5000 to U6000. And we add this membrane dissolvator directly after the ultrasonic nebulizer condenser. And this is done to further reduce the amount of sample solvent, in this case, volatile organic, that reaches the ICP. And that can cause some of the issues you saw in the last slide. And once we do that, this is what the system lo looks like. Um, it is a module that's stackable, meaning you know, the ultrasonic nebulizer, the base unit, simply sits right on top of it. So the footprint is remaining the same. The height simply increases. And we simply designate the combination of the two systems, the ultrasonic nebulizer and the membrane dissolvator, as the U6000. So going back to our schematic, if you recall the one I showed a few slides ago, we had the ultrasonic nebulizer portion with its heated glassware and then the condenser. In this case, then, after the condenser, we're going to add a further step of desolvation to help remove volatile organic solvent. Volatile organic solvent, of course, even in a condenser, there's going to be a finite vapor pressure of the organic solvent in the condenser, and some of that will still escape. We want to try to remove <clears throat> as much of that as possible, and in that case, we'll use the membrane. The membrane is composed of a tubular porous membrane. And the outlet from the ultrasonic nebulizer condenser passes through that flowing counter current in the opposite direction to that flow of gas is what we call an argon sweep gas. And it sweeps around the outside of the move any of these solvent vapors, which then pass through the porous membrane. And then those are simply sent to an exhaust. So finally, what then reaches the ICP after these steps is a much more uh, desolvated dry aerosol of solid sample particle or solid analyte particles that were in the uh, original sample liquid. So first application that we're going to talk about is the analysis of a nonpolar solvent, in this case, naphtha. Naphtha is a solvent similar to what you might find at a hardware store called Coleman Cam Fuel, and it's burned in many countries as a fuel. So detection of potentially toxic elements of interest, such as arsenic, cadmium, and lead are important. 
naphtha is typically composed of C5 to C9 hydrocarbons, so it is quite volatile. The instrumentation we're going to use, of course, we're going to be using the U6000 AT plus ultrasonic nebulizer membrane dissolvator combination. And for the ICP OES work, we're using a Perkin-Elmer Avio 500, which is a simultaneous detecting ICP, and a Perkin-Elmer Nexian 300D quadrupole ICPMS, which does have a KED gas addition uh, capability, in this case, helium. So, installation steps. So, how would you then first set up the U6000 AT Plus on the host ICP OES or host ICP MS? First, you would remove the standard nebulizer and spray chamber from the host instrument. You then connect the nebulizer gas line between the ICP instrument and the ultrasonic nebulizer, in this case, the U6000. Then connect the sample out tube from the ultrasonic nebulizer to the membrane module. And then finally from the membrane module to the ICP torch. A few other details, if necessary, and we'll look at this a little bit later in the presentation, you may need to tee in an oxygen supply in the sample out tube between the membrane dissolvator and the ICP. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. You're also going to connect an argon sweep gas supply to the membrane module <clears throat> in order to then remove any of the excess sample solvent that does escape uh, the condenser. That argon sweep gas supply is typically teed off of the main argon supply to the ICP, or it can be from a, a separate house supply or a separate argon tank. Then you connect the power cords to both the ultrasonic nebulizer and the membrane module, turn on the power and wait about 10 minutes for the heater and cooler to stabilize. Start the ICP, introduce your tune solution, and you press one button, the yellow operate button, to begin nebulizing tune solution and then samples, and then you adjust the two gas flows for best signal. That would be the nebulizer gas flow, which is controlled by the host ICP, and the sweep gas flow, which you can manually control on the front of the membrane box. Overall setup will take about 15 minutes. Of note, there is no computer control and no software installation needed. Sample introduction can, of course, be done manually if you only have a limited number of samples, or can be easily automated by connecting the sample inlet line to an auto sampler. Examples would be like a SeaTac ASX280 or ASX560 auto sampler. So, Here's an example of an interface kit, and I'll have some more details on these toward the end of the presentation. Uh, but every unit, uh, be it a U5000 or a U6000, uh, will be shipped with this interface kit so you can connect uh, a uh, argon uh, gas supply to the uh, ultrasonic nebulizer and then the outlet of the nebulizer to the host ICP torch. Okay. And we have these kits for all the major manufacturers. So, first a schematic of what the setup of a U6000 with an ICP OES would look like. So there you see the uh, uh, schematic drawing of a U6000 AT+. Uh, we have an argon sweep gas flow that we would attach that takes any of the excess sample solvent out of the membrane box. Argon nebulizer gas, we're going to use the control of that from the host ICP. Okay. The sample out then from the membrane module then heads to the ICP torch. If needed, we would then add a low flow of oxygen gas um, uh, in between that. If we needed to do that uh, if to prevent buildup, of, especially of carbon, on ICPMS sampler and skimmer cones. In some instances, you may not need to use it but it is a capability that, uh, that, uh, that can be added. So here is a picture of what the U6000 AT Plus looks like next to a host ICP, in this case, the Perkin-Elmer Avio 500. Uh, you can see you can mount it directly on the bench top 
next to the host ICP. If you need it, of course, you would also have an auto sampler nearby if you wanted to automate the analysis, or you could put the U6000 on a laboratory cart. But overall, it does not take up too much bench space. And the nice thing is that um, the ultrasonic can simply stack on top of the membrane module. A little bit more detail of this, you can actually see now the Nebgas supply line. And we're using, again, the uh, nebulizer um, gas port supply on the host ICP. We're simply going to attach a dedicated line between that and the ultrasonic nebulizer. And then the outlet then simply attaches directly to the ICP torch. The standard uh, sample introduction kit, nebulizer and spray chamber, uh, say it's a glass concentrate and a cyclonic, nebuli a cyclonic spray chamber, are simply taken off and removed. Right below it, um, you see the host IC peristaltic pump. And almost always, uh, we would use that for, introdu for introduction of the liquid sample uh, to the uh, ultrasonic nebulizer. Now, one additional picture which shows a little bit more detail of the actual connections on the back panel of a U6000. And I did mention that the outlet of the ultrasonic nebulizer then attaches to the membrane module. And that is done in a green color callout. So if uh, you say you were not doing organic solvents, that line with the green callout would connect directly to the ICP torch but well, we're going to put it first through the membrane desolvator for additional desolvation, particularly in this case of volatile organics. The blue callout is the argon sweep gas. And again, that supply can be teed off from the main argon supply to the ICP or from a separate source. In the red again is the uh, nebulizer gas supply, and this will be coming from the host ICP or ICPMS. Instead of going to the standard nebulizer, it goes to that port on the back of the USN. And finally, in the orange call out, the sample to ICP, after we've sent everything through both the ultrasonic and the membrane box, that line then takes the final sample out to the ICP torch. One last little detail, which is important that I'll point out, is there is a small peristaltic pump. Uh, you can see on the right side of the top module, the top a part which is the ultrasonic nebulizer, that is to remove any liquid condensate, and that would be either aqueous or organic. Uh, that small peristaltic pump is not used to move the sample uh, into the nebulizer, it's simply to remove uh, excess condensate. So here I have a very short video, maybe just about five to 10 seconds, that'll show you uh, the one button operation uh, for the USN. I simply press the yellow button and we'll zoom in and you can see the generation of the aerosol in that conical shaped spray chamber. Okay. And the next slide I've simply frozen that. You can see it's contained in there and it's a very thick fog. Okay. The transducer is called out in blue, and that's what's generating the aerosol. In the red, we have the sample inlet line. That would be connected to the host peristaltic pump with the other end, if you were going to automate it, to the auto sampler. And finally, the aerosol in the middle of the chamber. There is then an argon gas flow that will come in at the upper left part of the chamber. And that nebulizer gas flow will be coming from the host ICP. So again, you would have control of that through the uh, host ICP software. So some summary then of how we're going to approach um, the uh, measurement of trace elements of NAFTA. Again, we're going to use the U6000 AT+. We're going to use the host ICP OES peristaltic pump to introduce the NAFTA sample. And we're going to use what's called a Solva PVC-based pump tubing which is resistant to hydrocarbons, um, and we're going to use that to pump the samples in. The commercial naphtha source we're going to use uh, contains a mixture of C5 to C9 hydrocarbons, 
These include pentane, cyclohexane, heptane, octane, and nonane. And of course, we're going to use oil-based trace element standards for making up standards and spikes. So a quick view of our operating conditions. One that I'll point out is the nebulizer gas. The nebulizer gas flow seems relatively low at 0.35 liter per minute. That's advantageous because it allows a longer residence time of the sample aerosol inside the ultrasonic nebulizer, and that helps get better condensation. We'll use a normal uptake rate of about one mil per minute. We'll use axial viewing, and we'll use a little bit smaller torch injector to minimize any uh, organic salt vapor that does escape uh, and gets into the ICP. And then our conditions on our U6000 system, uh, what I'll point out is the cooler temperature, we can go down to as low as minus 20. Typically, I will set at minus 15 degrees C. And again, this is for volatile organics that will have a very low freezing point. Again, this helps reduce the vapor pressure of the organic solvent before we go into the membrane dissolvator. And then finally, the argon sweep gas flow, we're going to use a flow of about 2 liter per minute of argon, and that will flow around the outside of the membrane. And, of course, that then removes any of the organic solvent that permeates through the membrane. The sweep gas then sends that off to an exhaust for removal. So calibration. Uh, we've prepared four standards in polypropylene vials at 20, 50, 100, and 200 nanograms per gram. Magnesium was calibrated a little bit lower because it was a little more sensitive at the higher end from 20 to 100 nanograms per gram. And in this case, we did not use any internal standard. So some examples of the calibrations. Here's for arsenic at the uh, 188.979 nanometer line. Uh, correlation coefficient is uh, 390. We want at least 295 to be valid for calibration. So that's met for arsenic. And then cadmium at 395, so that was good. And then also lead at 395. So three of the important elements we really wanted to focus on, uh, we could easily calibrate at, at uh, part per billion levels in the solid by weight. So, uh, the next two slides are very informative to show what uh, all the benefit of the membrane desalvation is. So there are actually two lines that are overlaid in this graph. Uh, you can see the blue line and the green line. The green line was a blank. And to simulate carbon being introduced just through the ultrasonic nebulizer, and this was the highest level we could put through without affecting the plasma, um, you, you see the, the background emission around arsenic. We then spiked in 10 part per billion, 10 micrograms per liter, uh, into that blank, and that's the blue line. And you see, well, there really is no change in the two lines. They simply overlay over each other, and there's no membrane desalvation going on. So we're not able to see this lower level of arsenic. And this was done with just an ultrasonic nebulizer with a little bit of IPA or isopropyl alcohol to simulate some organic. Okay. So with even the USN, we weren't able to, to pick it up in that particular matrix. However, in the next slide, we then actually went ahead and put in a, a low level of arsenic, five nanograms per gram in the naphtha. And we then ran this through the U6000 where we now have the ability to better remove the organic solvent. So we still have the ultrasonic nebulizer there, but we've added the membrane module. The yellow is the unspiked naphtha, but the green is the spike naphtha. And now with the reduction of the organic solvent and the much lower loading of carbon, we're able to see this uh, small arsenic signal on top of the background. And there's something we could not then see without use of the membrane dissolvator. And this is done in a straight organic solvent, 100% uh, naphtha. 
So then looking at some of our instrument detection limits and LOQs, our limits of quantitation for 22 elements, it's defined as three times the standard deviation of the blank concentration, which would be the naphtha blank. The LOQ, the limit of quantitation, is 10 times the standard deviation of the blank concentration. And you can see the quite low levels that uh, we are able to achieve um, well sub nanogram per gram or single digit nanogram per gram depending upon the element. So we have two graphs. I split them so a little bit easier to see. So we went from silver all the way to vanadium. So, and of course, uh, a number of the elements, cadmium, uh, arsenic, lead, antimony, thallium, uh, more toxic elements that, that are going to be of interest. Spike recoveries. Now remember, our lowest calibration standard is only 20 nanograms per gram. And we then decided to see, well, what would be our recoveries if we really started to push down lower, certainly closer uh, to some of the limits of quantitation. At that level of five nanograms per gram, we're four times lower, and we're still doing quite good. Uh, we're looking at a range of, say, recovery of 70 to 120 percent. Uh, certainly at 20 nanograms per gram, the recoveries are very good of the low standard. Uh, we're easily uh, in that range of 90 to 120 percent. The one element that we did have difficulties with at the 5 nanograms per gram was potassium, uh, which is a difficult element to, to sometimes see at low levels at 766.490. But overall, this was uh, very good, especially for the spike recovery of the very low 5 uh, PPB or 5 nanogram per gram in the, in, a, in, a solid by, in a liquid by weight. So we then wanted to run a uh, actual reference material. In this case, we ran uh, NIST uh, 1085A. Um, there is a series of, of wear metals uh, standards uh, uh, in lubricating oil. I just showed you the picture of the latest one that we have here at the lab, which is the 1085C, but they're provided in these glass ampules. And you'll have both a blank and you'll have a fortified blank. Uh, we had to dilute the, the blank and the sample by 10, uh, by 10,000 in naphtha to give us an approximate concentration of 30 nanograms per gram. And then we simply diluted, uh, simply corrected for the dilution um, and then compare it to the certificate values. So 30 nanograms per gram falls in the middle of our calibration. And you can see then the recoveries are, are very good. Uh, they range from about uh, 95 to 120% for um, the elements uh, that were uh, certified in the uh, NIST 1085A uh, wear metals and lubricating oil. So, some conclusions and benefits. So, if we then combined the ultrasonic nebulizer, the U5000 AT Plus, with the membrane desulfator, we can reduce the naphtha-induced background, enabling single-digit and sub-nanogram per gram detection. Acceptable percent recoveries even of a very low 5 nanogram per gram spike. The, straight, the uh, setup of the U6000 AT Plus is straightforward. Uh, we use the argon supply and the peristaltic pump from the host ICP. The membrane module is placed directly beneath the ultrasonic nebulizer, so it saves benchtop space. We have this enhanced removal of organic. Of course, it's going to improve the lifetime of your sample reduction components. In this case, the ICP torch is not going to then be coated with any carbon deposition. No computer control required, no software required. So uh, the uh, both the setup and then uh, use of the U6000 AT Plus is, is very straightforward. So then moving to the next application, in this application we wanted to look at a polar organic solvent, one that would contain, say, oxygen. In this case, 
we looked at isopropyl alcohol. Another one uh, that has been looked at in <clears throat> other applications is methyl isobutyl ketone, or MIBK, another very common solvent. Isopropyl alcohol is of interest because it's used to wash silicon wafers as part of the wafer production process in the semiconductor industry. This step requires very low trace element blank levels to avoid possible trace element contamination on the wafer, which could then cause wafer failure. So in this case, we're going to move from using ICP-OES as detection to ICP-MS. So the schematic diagram or layout is really essentially the same. Okay. We're again going to place the U6000 AT plus on the bench top or the cart. We're going to connect our gas flows, sweep gas. We're going to use the argon nebulizer gas control from the host ICPMS. In this case, we are going to add in a supply of oxygen gas. Um, and we did use a device we had here at SeaTac, a blend gas accessory. Uh, now users would probably use the uh, oxygen control as they would have on their uh, host ICP uh, OES or host ICP MS for this task. Or you can set up your own little device with a needle valve. The amount of oxygen you will need is, is fairly limited, but it's largely there to prevent carbon buildup on your sample, introdu on your, uh, sample introduction components. So here's what it looks like. In this case, we had it on a laboratory cart. And in the upper left, you can see the sample introduction area of the host Perkin Elmer Nexian 300D ICPMS. There was the U6000 in front of you. And then we had our small blend gas accessory to the side uh, to add the small amount of oxygen. So operating conditions. Again, the nebulizer gas flow, and again, I'll point this out, is relatively low compared to using uh, the nebulizer gas flow and the standard setup with your normal nebulizer. Typically, that might be around 0.8 to 1 uh, liter per minute. But in this case, it's, it's lower in order to get more residence time for the sample aerosol inside the desolvation apparatus. I did mention earlier about kinetic energy discrimination, and we are going to use that for a few elements, and we'll talk about why in just a little bit. Uh, and we are going to use some oxygen uh, addition gas. Uh, we're going to use about 10 mil per minute, so not very much, and that'll be teed in between the membrane dissolvator module and the host ICP torch. Um, in this application, we didn't have to go quite as cold. We went down to zero degrees C for the isopropyl alcohol. Now there you see we also have a temperature control on the membrane, the solvator. We do keep it uh, quite warm in order to keep everything in a vapor phase and to prevent condensation. And in this case, the temperature was kept at 160 degrees C. The argon sweep gas flow was 1.8, a value of around two liter per minute, and of course you can tune it through a range, is typically what's used in order to remove any of the um, sample solvent that passes through the membrane. So calibration, four standards were prepared in reagent grade isopropyl alcohol by weight using density in low density polyethylene bottles, 20, 50, 100, and 200 nanograms per gram. Calibration for uh, the iron, manganese, and tin started a little bit higher at 50 nanograms per liter and then included just two additional standards at 100 and 200. We're simply going to use standard uh, PVC peristaltic pump tubing for the uh, isopropyl alcohol in this case. Uh, no internal standard again is used. And as I mentioned, oxygen addition was used. And again, this is used to prevent carbon buildup on the sampler and skimmer cones of the ICPMS. For that reason, the kinetic energy discrimination mode with a little bit of helium gas was needed to decrease oxide levels for some analytes, and we'll show that in a couple of upcoming tables. So instrument detection limits, uh, again, these IDLs will range from about 0.2 to 15 nanograms per liter, or 0.2 to 15 part per trillion. 
and you can see the elements that were done in standard mode, meaning no KED gas, and some of the ones that were. And I'll point out cobalt, chromium, iron, and in the next slide, manganese and nickel. Uh, I'll also mention that this analysis was done under non-clean room conditions and without a higher purity grade of isopropyl alcohol. We did not have an electronic grade of uh, isopropyl alcohol available for these tests. So these detection limits are quite good uh, considering the, the conditions that we were running. Again, around 0.2 to 15 part per trillion is the range of the instrument detection limits for uh, these metals uh, that were achieved. Okay, several elements of note have severe carbon-based interferences at their highest percent isotope. And again, uh, we're using quadrupole ICPMS with unit mass resolution. So in particular, magnesium-24, and I did earlier mention the carbon uh, dimer-based interference, C2+, aluminum-27, which is the 100% isotope of aluminum, and chromium-52. So when we, though, use the U6000 AT plus with oxygen addition and ICPMS detection, we can still enable sub-PPB calibration for these elements. So just some numbers quick to look at. Um, the elements, magnesium, aluminum, chromium. You can see the blanks that we were able to reduce to when we were using the U6000 AT plus. Um, the BEC right next to it, the background equivalent concentration, is how much the background then computes to once we calibrate. So that level of blank for magnesium is about 20 part per trillion, and then lower for aluminum and chromium, obviously, as the background signal goes down, uh, three and about eight part per trillion. Correlation coefficients were all good. So as we look at our calibration curves. And again, we're calibrating in this case using standards below a part per billion. We're going from 20, 50, 100, and 200 part per trillion uh, in reagent grade isopropyl alcohol. And when we extrapolate down, you can see then what the blank level is at, at zero spike. That's for magnesium. Then for aluminum, and then for chromium, 52. So then spike recoveries, and this would be at the uh, lowest uh, uh, calibration standard, which is 20 part per trillion or 20 nanograms per gram. And you can see our recoveries uh, are, all, are all good. Uh, they're running in a range, again, of around uh, 90 to 120 percent. Okay, so conclusions and benefits. Again, <clears throat> using the membrane desalvation capability, we can reduce the carbon-based mass spectral interferences, allowing IDLs in a range of 0.2 to 15 nanograms per liter, or 0.2 to 15 part per trillion for 18 elements, along with acceptable recoveries of the low 20 part per trillion spike. All of this done, again, using uh, a reagent grade isopropyl alcohol and non-clean room conditions. So, some last details uh, regarding uh, the U6000 AT plus. I just wanted to mention uh, the, the part numbers um, in, in case uh, you have <clears throat> interest in this type of unit. There is a unit that is set up for plugging into 115 volt and another one for 220 volt. And those are the, the two part numbers, just difference between A and B. And then as I mentioned and showed you the uh, one example of the different interface kits, these interface kits, again, one is provided at no charge, which with each U6000 AT plus, um, and this would be a separate line item that would enter in, and you simply specify the model ICP OES or ICP MS that you have, and then you see we have examples 
from uh, all of the major manufacturers. Okay. So finally, some important notes. And uh, these uh, are for some of the common questions that come up about the unit. The U6000 AT Plus is not a different type of ultrasonic nebulizer. The ultrasonic nebulizer type that's used is the same as the base model U5000 AT Plus. Okay. U6000 AT Plus means that the base U5000 AT Plus is supplied with the membrane dissolvator module. Now, the module itself, sometimes a, a customer has acquired separately, is called an MDX200. Okay. It's not uh, commonly talked about, but the MD is simply stands for membrane dissolvator. When the U5000 AT Plus and the MDX200 are combined, then that is what's called the U6000 AT Plus. Okay. That's all. The user can always detach the membrane dissolvator module, simply disconnect it and set it aside, the MDX200, and use the ultrasonic nebulizer part as a U5000 AT+, as is typically used for aqueous samples. So, for example, you could acquire a U6000 AT+, you could use it to run volatile organic solvents, and when that application is done, you could simply detach the membrane module, set it aside, the ultrasonic part you could simply use to then introduce aqueous samples such as drinking water or wastewater and it would function the same as a U5000 AT+. So again, the term U6000 AT+, does not denote that the ultrasonic portion is any different, just that you add additional desolvation capability in case you need it for a volatile organic like naphtha, isopropyl alcohol, lean, MIBK, and the like. Okay. So acknowledgement, a uh, special thanks to our uh, former colleague, Mary Jo Minky Wright, for her work in sample preparation, method development, data collection, and outline text for these two very important applications uh, using the U6000 AT Plus for both ICP Optical and ICP MS. And where to go for more information. So you can certainly contact, if you have an existing unit, the uh, service team here at CTAC by CTAC service at teledyne.com. Uh, if you have questions for, about acquiring a system or spare parts for a system, certainly uh, you can contact our sales support at CTAC sales at teledyne.com. Technical support can certainly come to myself at fred.smith at teledyne.com or my colleague Paula Duscott at paula.duscott at teledyne.com. And there is additional information on the Teledyne CTEC website. And I've provided links below that will take you right to the U6000 page. And for more details to both applications, uh, the two uh, application notes, the first one will be for the NAFTA application with ICP. And the second one, the 004, for the uh, isopropyl alcohol application for ICPMS. So again, as Shelley mentioned uh, at the beginning of the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email them in, and then uh, I will respond to those as soon as possible. And uh, with that, uh, again, the webinar will probably be put up on the website and or on YouTube. Uh, so you can look at it later, and then I'll turn it over to Shelley. Okay, Fred, I believe that concludes the webinar, and yep. we just want to thank everybody again for attending. Have a great day. Thank you. Yep.